Okay, and we're back. We're going to switch uh, hour two tonight and go talk to Yochi Shimatsu over in Hong Kong and uh, hopefully get Dana Dernford online here as well. And we're going to talk about the annual, well, we'll break it down to weekly, our, our weekly Fukushima report. Although the annual report continues to get uh, just terrible. Uh, things are not getting better. They're getting worse. We talked about this last week. We talked about how there is one product, and it is Chernobyl proven. You can find it by going to my homepage. Let's look for my name. There are three blue banners. It'll take you right to the page. It is Bio Superfood, and it will immediately start to eliminate radioactivity from your body through the urine and probably through the sweat as well. Uh, it is a, a, just a remarkable product, and I urge you to take a look at it. I, I've taken it every day for four years, and I wouldn't be without it. All right, Yochi, welcome back. How are you? Well, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, just a bit astonished by all the developments. Oh, it's That's just unbelievable. The FEMA second robot that they sent in there to monitor to uh, examine the site uh, went yeah. down also. Yep. Uh, you know, did not last very long. So, its findings, and also the fact that uh, Tokyo Electric would not show the last few seconds, last ten seconds or so, what the robot was viewing on video before it went down. So, uh, you know, some alarming things. But meanwhile, you know, this, um, the J- Japan Atomic Energy Agency is sponsoring right now a star. Uh, on this new research and development center at Tokai. Sure. Uh, this is the site of many new, previous nuclear accidents, a nuclear reactor in that general area. Um, and a lot of American companies, European companies in attendance as if, and it's quite foolish of them because the area is very radioactive there. You know, Ibaraki Prefecture was bombarded with those nano balls of uh, highly radioactive, uh, uh, isotopes, you know, including plutonium, all fused together in these tiny little, like, pachinko balls, or what we call it, ball bearings. And so, um, not advisable for people, even if they work for the nuclear industry, to uh, go to that area. Plus, this is a general area where 150 uh, dolphins recently beached, many of them, uh, well, many of them dying on shore, the others obviously dying offshore. You know, I'm sure the whole pod went down. So, you know, it's an area of continuing contamination. And here they're having a research and development center for decommissioning the uh, reactors of Fukushima. And the question is, why didn't do they, they, they do this four years ago? You know, I mean, what took so long? So, obviously, more and more bad news coming in. You know, many of the workers have to be retired out because they get the limit on radiation. And uh, so just work, running out of workforce, so that's going to have to recruit foreigners somehow to come in and sacrifice their lives uh, for this project. So, so we know the reaction. Well, they're, they're, they are literally asking them to come in and die. You're right. Yeah, basically, you're going to recruit people. And being foreigners, it won't really matter very much. You know, it's not a lot of accountability. You know, just be uh, written off. Oh, you can't have a free condition or something like that. You know, so... So this is the uh, problem we're facing, and then the internals of this uh, reactor. One, this is this is the smallest of the reactors, by the way, that melted down, and it's supposedly just a uranium reactor. Uh-huh. And some bizarre things are happening, and uh, there's some uh, confusion over what the internal readings are. You know, Tokyo Electric is trying to promote that. You know, uh, well, they were saying uh, ten uh, ten Sieverts an hour. When the first yeah, robot actually, went down, now they're yeah, saying so when the robot went out, it was forty-eight fevers an hour in rising. You know, so we we can't really trust. Obviously, yeah, ten maybe on the outskirts, but you know, there's yeah, yeah. obviously some sort of upward venting coming through this thing. Something and, is uh, something is coming up. The Wall Street Journal uh, says yeah. uh, Tepco to abandon the second robot inside the Fukushima reactor. So that's both robots have lasted just an hour or two or three, and they're dead. Yeah, yeah. They don't want to pull yeah. them out. You know why? Because they've been bathed in up to 50 sieverts an hour 
of radioactivity, right. and to pull them out of there would be insane. You leave well, them in. It's very difficult to pull them out because they'll basically lose another three or four robots trying to pull them out. You know? Ah, yes. So therefore, yeah. so that's a problem. You know, and the more that they lose, the more junk is going to be in the path of any future uh, kind of. Uh, these uh, little tractor, mini tractors going in there. So basically, situation very bad, and the fact that the radiation is so unevenly dis- distributed, and the fact that there is steam in it. Now, now the other thing is that you know the TEPCO numbers are the internal temperature is something like twenty. The highest one they said is twenty degrees centigrade, which is sixty-eight Fahrenheit, mm-hmm. which therefore would not account for steam being generated inside the reactor. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sure. You would have to have much hotter temperatures to sure. boil water to reach the 100 degree. You know, yeah, well, it's 212 degrees to boil water, I think. Okay, and then so that is not happening in the reactor, obviously. Okay, or you have a higher temperature there. You know, there's not much space between the uh, uh, bottom of the containment uh, vessel and uh, uh, this, this, uh, the, the, basically the floor of the, of the reactor that we're talking about, okay, the reactor, the chamber itself where the nuclear reactions occur. So therefore, this means that the steam is arising from somewhere far below and it's cooling off as it gets to this point inside the pressurized vessel. So therefore... All we can conclude is the corium is pretty far down, you know, and it's, it's moving through a lot of uh, colder rock and water to break through. And it's actually a form of fog, not a steam. It's not steam, it's fog. So this was another indication the corium, the corium is long ago broke through containment, is in the ground, and uh, whatever that uh, uh, water vapor is inside uh-huh. is, is, uh, is generating far below the ground and it has really radically cooled off, you know, since uh, huh. uh, the water was boiling. So yeah, that's another yeah, yeah. sign. You know, I mean, these are just like it's just simple kitchen science deductions that we can make, right? And you know, what's true in the kitchen is true in the reactor, too, because, you know, the uh, water behaves in the same way. You know, uh, the, the, the boiling uh, point of water doesn't vary, you know? Uh, so, you know, unless under extreme pressure, of course. So um, the other thing is, uh, glowing, uh, blue and green, you know, so. Weird colors. Blue, know? green, yeah, yellow. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, as I've argued, uh, I think uh, radioactive sulfur is one of the elements there, and, but there's probably many others. Uh, the, uh, this meltdown was so severe, it just made everything radioactive, including the iron, uh, the cobalt, the manganese inside the steel, and so, from the earlier robot, we saw, yeah, you know, I, I later saw some other scenes from there where the metal structure inside the, the support structure for the rod, um, you see it's massively pitted and some of these, uh, you know, holes inside the surface are quite big, you know, and they're not all, so they, they tend to be circular, but not all of them are circular, indicating what I said, uh, in the last show that the metal, uh, not only expanded from heat, but it expanded from molecular uh, not molecular, but nuclear, uh, expansion. That, you know, the, the, the bombardment was so intense that the sure. added protons and neutrons made the steel, the ferrous molecules actually transform. Sure. Into other, uh, elements. And that, in that expansion, it just blew out whole pieces, you know, like throughout every beam, you see like hundreds of holes. So basically, the structure is not really steel anymore. You know, I mean, iron, there may be a little bit of iron left. I don't know what it is. Be, yeah, it's been... We don't know what it's composed well, it's been of, transfigured into something else. Exactly. It's all been transfigured into something else, which does not have the structural strength of steel. So the thing, obviously, is doomed to come down with the re- recurrent earthquakes we have in the area. The, the thing is, it does not have the strength of steel anymore. And it's, ho- it's sitting over a hollow space if the uh, temperatures at 20 de- degree temperatures in any indication with the presence of steam. It's sitting, yeah. it's, it's sitting on top of hollow vents in the ground, in uh-huh. the uh-huh. far down below, which we exactly. predicted, you know, like in the first year, right? In the first few months, we we're saying mm-hmm. this, what happened the reactors. And I did interview one nuclear, uh, engineer, right? A member of the Japanese parliament who said there's a great fear that he had a great fear that the reactors will collapse into the ground below, 
Okay, so I think this, you know, he made that call. When did he say that? Something. Well, I think I wrote you a story about he's the only nuclear uh, uh, engineer in the in the parliament. I interviewed him. I sent you some of his comments. It was uh-huh. one of the early stories. And then um, he had this fear that he said these things are massively heavy. You know, they're massively heavy. And if the ground underneath gets laced by meltdowns, the corium breaks through, that the sure. ground is going to be unstable. And that in any case, there's just a lack of maintenance of the area. You know, the water flow is going through and all that. There's great underground instability. And he's afraid that the whole reactor structure will collapse into itself and, and go underground. He said at that point, there'll be no way to get, you know, to do any work on it. You know, it would just be impossible to get in there because it would just be one massive radioactive mess and many enormous amounts of radiation out of the ground. And corium, you know, uh, you got to remember in that first year, the corium was uh, uh, inside the reactor chamber. It was like something like 250 sieverts an hour uh, levels of radiation. It's, it's still down there somewhere, you know, a couple hundred sieverts, uh, 150 sieverts, down, down below the ground right now. Correct. But yep. if you collapse yeah. everything and everything shatters, assuming the steel cannot hold that, it's in fact an amalgam mm-hmm. of uh, all kinds of uh, com- uh, of elements. It may well be. Yeah. It'll crack open, and we're going to see this hundred sieverts, you know, just pouring out of the heat there, and out of the so-called steam, out of the fog emitting from the place, which would be a major disaster. It'll be the end of most of northern Japan, if that's the case. You know, the, they'll be totally out of containment then. We're talking about, you know, uh, there has been levels of containment, even underground, you know, layers of ground. But at that point, if it does collapse... Uh, I'm afraid the situation is going to be very bad until it can be. Somehow they'll pro- probably try to patch it and cover it, but that will take time, and I'm not sure mm-hmm. who's going to do that job. Mm-hmm. You know, so so the solution. I, I don't. Again, I don't see have, how much longer we can continue to dodge this bullet. Something is going to give, and when it does, they've got to start moving, and they've got to get some tunneling machines. They've got to bore. You know, I think one engineer, I, I read some post somewhere about boreholes, you know. Uh, uh-huh. Exactly. Uh-huh. Yes. But bigger than boreholes, we're talking about tunneling into the rock, not into the sedimentary rock, you know, but not into that porous rock, but into the solid rock of the Ab- Abakuma Plateau, which is basically seabed rock. It's extremely hard. It's brittle, yeah, but uh, I think it's scalable. You know, you do, do a tunnel. Isn't that, and you can, you, can you go down to get it, or do you, do you have to go back and well, up to get well, it? Well, it would be better to do it at an angle, you know, so that, it, you know, you can uh, control it and have tunnels uh, go down to it. Sure. So if, if, you know, radiation builds up, you can pump water down there. So basically, you would need a mega system of tunnels there as a permanent uh, repository with, you know, sort of going down at a diagonal. And then you would have uh, access tunnels, you know, uh, going down vertically to it so we can monitor and uh, do whatever necessary. Pour boron in there, you know, uh, boric acid, whatever we need to do uh, to, uh, you know, contain, uh, the, to prevent the possibility of another explosion down there, or a fusion reaction, something sure. like that. Sure, sure, My concern is about this. When that thing skyrocketed, you know, how do you get from 10 to 48 Fever, you know, in a short, relatively short distance in the interior. It doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, it would seem that... Well, I'm not a nuclear get physicist, an but... 25, 30 fevers, yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. You have yeah. these variations yeah. what, in what, radiation What's causing the surges? Chambers. Yeah, I don't get it. I, it. It seems a nuclear scientist, an honest one, should be able to come up with a guess, but I haven't seen any. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing suddenly went down, and I think what happened, they, the, the camera actually... Spotted some sort of a, a discolorized flash. I, I assume, you know, we've seen these sort of uh, mini reactions, right? When the when uh, uh, reactor three was going down, we saw all the these sort of uh, uh, blue light, white light, yellow light, sort of like little sort of they look like little uh, fireworks, you know, just bursting out just for a millisecond, you know, just bursting out, which seem to be like the mini fusion reactions of tritium and heavy water. Fusing and then hitting, let's say, a hot particle of plutonium and just causing this. I mean, we're talking just a tiny, tiny you know, mouth and gas, okay? We're talking gas reactions in gas and gas plasma start bursting out. And I'm wondering if uh, it's the gas plasma that's bubbling up, and that's what is causing 
the differential and radiate. You see what I'm saying? I do. It, it is like a bubble of gas that comes out, you know, it's gasified nucleotides, all right? That bubbles up and it's sort of like coming up like a bubble through the air inside the reactor. And that would account for how you get the difference between a 48 and reading and a 10 uh, fever reading. And, and then a certain, if this thing hits the robot, possible a flash of current, you know, the, the electronics in the robot might be just sufficient just to trigger a reaction, you know, just to spark a reaction. I'm not sure, you know, but it, it is curious that they did cut out that last 10 seconds of the video. They, you know, they censored it out because uh, this, is, this is something they're very afraid of. That there's going to be many more, there's new types of fusion reactions going on, and then the larger one will trigger another major nuclear explosion. Uh, you know, here's just the, the Earth will burst forward like a volcano, and they'll release it's just basically deadly nucleotides that will, uh, you know, basically go around the planet and uh, kill everything in the northern hemisphere. You know, massive cloud of radio, uh, radioactive powder. Uh, and this could, happen. Yeah. this could happen. This could happen. I, I this think that's happen. what they're afraid of. That is the end game. They're really, the thing that they're really afraid of, that whatever is out of control down there he is making a plasma uh, nuclear gas, you know, a, 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 a gas of radioactive iron science. And whatever took out the camera may be that. But you, you follow my, uh, what I'm saying here. Oh, a sure. Of gas coming up yeah. okay, from down below the, uh, reactor. You know, Some, well, and, uh, it could be, it could be moisture pushing this stuff up. I don't, we don't know. Well, it's flowing through a column of, uh, of, uh, of fog, basically. It's flowing through a column. So the fog tends to, you know, the water, uh, tension in the fog tends to keep the gas together, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. coming up like a bubble, okay, it's bubbling up from water through a fog, so the gas tends to hold together, and, but as soon as it hits some sort of electrical charge, or let's say a particle of plutonium, a small particle of plutonium uranium, it then uh, has a, a fusion and fission reaction, mm-hmm. a quick fusion and fission reaction occur in succession, and you get a mini blast, you know, it's you a would. Tiny, like a little firecracker, it's like... Yep. You know, TNT, yep. you can build a blockbuster bomb with the stuff, or mm-hmm. you can make a tiny firecracker, or even, a, you know, a cap for a cap gun, a pistol, mm-hmm. cap pistol. Mm-hmm. You can, so, in other words, same thing in nucleotides. Although humans can't do it. You know, our scientists can't do something like that. We have an environment here that can do that, okay? It, it, it can handle very, it can make explosions with very, very small amounts of nucleated gas, which is very reactive. It's no longer a solid as a gas, but it's very reactive. It's something that we cannot, we haven't yet to do in the lab. It's something we don't really understand too well. Okay. All right, so let's I go. Uh, we're still sitting on the edge of total catastrophe. Okay. Well, of course we are, and it's going to get worse. Yeah. Let's go up to BC yeah, and find good. out what uh, yes. Dana Durnford has good. been up to. Uh, are, you, from, yeah. are you there, Dana? Yeah, hi, hi. Jeff. Thank you. Hi, Yoshi. Hey, Welcome. Hey, Welcome hearing. back. I just got in the port and getting ready. I fueled up before I gave it up for the day, and I'm ready to go down the coastline tomorrow. I'll start working my way down the south. And so finally finished the north end, uh, the northwest corner of Canada, and it's pretty bleak up here, folks. Anybody that's not up in the loop, we're looking at the species on the coastline of British Columbia, Canada, and we're, we discovered that most of the species, not most of them, the majority of the species are actually missing, and we're confirmed it now. We've been on the ocean for eight months, and it's definitive that the coastline has been totally uh, wiped out and just a handful of algae remain, and that we're down to less than 1% of 1% of any You've been out eight been months? Eight months, and been on the go straight 140 days of getting back home. Good God. Expect another 40 days. And then, but another, you know, who would have thought that it would keep going outside of the fact that we couldn't even find pockets of life and in the, it has to be proven before you can have a debate. Everybody knows that. And so we've yeah. done it. Yeah. But, you know, it's never me. It's everybody out there, people from all around the planet, and everybody that supported it and kept it alive, including particularly yourself, Jeff, and Yoshi, you know. And it's those kind of uh, people behind the operation and everybody mm-hmm. donating and then out there on the ocean that we actually got the data. So that coastline is destroyed. At a 438 Saners that should be out there this year. There's only 38 now, and so I wonder what that was all about. I haven't got all the details on it, 
It was a rather interesting thing that only 38 sailors will work the coastline this year. And so, you know, that's literally the end of the fishery. Sardines have failed. The herring, obviously, now that's going to fail. Well, did, did, didn't I read that they had called an end to sardine season in California right. already? Because there aren't yeah, any? Right. You couldn't find any. Shocking, because that's the basis of the food chain for the bigger uh, fish. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And animals and marine life itself. And, uh, yeah. And so there you go, folks. We we got that sad stuff. and But now we have to really do something proper and think about the future. Like you guys were talking about how do you decommission those reactors. And sending in the homeless is not... Is you not don't recondition. How do you recondition or decommission or do anything with something that's destroyed? I don't I don't even know what they're thinking right. about. Like you the, guys were saying, you know, five heavers, if anybody not familiar, will kill you. So 10 is definitely going to kill you in 20 minutes or something. How about 50? So, that's why you won't see her. That's right. That's what you won't see. That'll annihilate you in about four minutes. Well, that's why they won't pull the robots out. I really believe that's, that's part of it. Yeah. It, it, that kind of radiation is never going to go away either. And no. No. You know, now now we got to face up to what we're dealing with because the dead Pacific Ocean, that stuff mm-hmm. is going to spread to the other oceans, and the bird life is missing. Last year we seen the insects were missing, mm-hmm. and they can't deny it much longer, and then obviously it's going to be too late, too late now. Even if you stop the reactors in Fukushima, you can't save the Pacific or much of anything else on this planet. Correct. That's because they lied about bananas, potato chips, and walking in sunshine for 70 years. That's the problem. See, a nuclear scientist can only be a lawyer. He can't be an actual scientist. He can only be a a arm, a, you know, another leg of the machine. He's got to get up and tell everybody, oh, it's like a banana, and it's like walking in sunshine, and it's like Unreal. potato chips. He's not, he's not allowed Unreal. to tell the truth. And so that's why the nuclear has failed. Yeah. Because scientists were never allowed to address the truth. They were only allowed to... Uh, pretend that there's something special and then propagate a lawyer and so they lost faith in themselves they lost faith in what they were doing obviously when they mm-hmm. had to go to that route mm-hmm. to come up to mm-hmm. a commercial I think every uh, no we're going to go ahead and go through it go ahead keep talking you know and so that's the problem and I was thinking about this heavily over the last several days I got pounded up here in the northwest corner just mass of seas mm-hmm. and just to get out there every day and get that data and get the understanding that if we don't have the data Mm-hmm. There's, no, you know, the people that are following this and are trying to, to change the world for the better. They need that data just like everybody else. They need to see it themselves, and to to, to gut up and go ahead and do the right thing. And we're seeing that in the media. There are scientists and academics now mm-hmm. starting to rally and starting to speak out and starting to be vocal and starting to uh, involve, you know, what scientists should be. And it's something that they can't be themselves, so there has to be an outsider that stands up. Like Yoshi, you know, imagine if he was still ready for the Japanese Times, what kind of, you know, power he could put behind his words and that he has so many years practicing with such eloquence. It can only be because of his heart and soul, because he understood he had an opportunity, got the education. And so when a lot of people say that they, they you know, what can I do? You look at Jeff, you look at Yoshi, and you think about people like that, and that's what it takes, is you got to go ahead and do it yourself, and you've got people out there that are already laid the groundwork, you can see how it works, and you just work towards your goal, you'll get it. And if, But if you don't, start. You don't put one foot or the other, the trip won't ever start. And in my case, the trip will never end, because, you know, we keep finding so much devastation, we have no choice but to keep going until it was over with, and it's over when it's over, I guess. I don't, you know, I've said many times, oh, it'll be over in a few weeks or a month. And I come to the realization that I'm trying to pacify and satisfy people uh, instead of trying to do the job that i got to do and worrying about other people. I don't do that no more. But that's, that was an issue for me where I, I thought that way. Once I broke that train of thought, mm-hmm. uh, I can do a much better job, much more proficient. And I'm really just getting right. on my game now. I'm really just becoming... You know, people don't understand the significance of what I'm saying, maybe, is that we're talking about a dead Pacific Ocean. It's not a joke. we never seen... Look, think about Three Mile Island, folks. It lasted five days. Think about Chernobyl. It lasted ten days. It was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. Yeah. yeah. It hasn't stopped, and it'll never stop, right, Jeff? No, it's never. No, 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 no. Hund- uh, hundreds and of years. They gotta admit, hundreds of years. Yeah, they got to admit that. they got to come and deal with it. And they got to free up the scientists to be able to do the job. 
if you keep the scientists, like there's no nuclear scientists on the Army Gunnison in North America, the only nuclear scientist is allowed to talk about Fukushima. Can, and can, everybody uh, else seems like they got them locked away. Can somebody uh, answer me this? And I'm not putting him down. Arnie did some wonderful work in the beginning, and it was seemingly a case where he was speaking freely, openly, uh, logically, pragmatically. He has all but vanished in the last six months. I don't see anything of him anymore talking. What, did they go subscription? Did they uh, tell him to shut up? He's not around. I just don't run across him. Well, Jeff, I mean, you know, uh, Arnie is a nuclear engineer, plant operator. He was just made, you know, there were all kinds of scurrilous accusations made against him. Oh, yeah. You know, within his own profession. Uh, so, you know, he was under assault. And, and the other thing is a nuclear engineer in some ways isn't prepared to ask, answer some of the questions of what's going on. We're talking about. Uh, you know, it, it's not a field that I'm strong in, but I did study chemistry and I did study some nuclear chemistry. Mm-hmm. And most engineers are not trained in those areas of understanding these reactions mm-hmm. beyond sort of more of like an engineer in a very technical, static way. They're, they're not taught to, you know, to examine phenomena as they are and try to figure out. You have to work backwards from your observation and go back over your science. So, you know, uh, in a certain sense, you know, I can understand why nuclear engineers are left speechless by what's going on. This stuff is way beyond. It's not in the manual. It's not what they've been taught. It's not in their education. So, so I would give them some credit, uh, some you know, some credit there because uh, it is beyond the imagination. I think of ninety nine percent of the people in the industry. I'm not but trying to take Tepco, any credit. Totally, oh. The Tokyo Electric Power is at a total loss. Yeah. The science industry is sampling in Japan. They're backed by Department of Energy who are scratching their heads, you know? So, you know, it is yeah. very difficult from a scientist's perspective to understand the complexity of what's going on and the enormity of it. No one's, like I said, this stuff has never been seen in the lab before. You know? No, no. And, uh, yeah, so yeah, this yeah. Is stuff beyond, you know, this is beyond anything that anyone knows right now. And when I suggest, you know, possible, uh, you know, uh, uh, uh pathways of why this is, is happening, that is just based on very rough logical dedu- deduction, okay, uh, of these processes. They're rough schema. They're not like uh, precisely detailed. And a scientist or engineer would have to be a lot more precise, okay. So I think that's where they're caught. They can't make these sort of rough sketches, you know. And and I think so. The science itself is very very much curved. The methods of science curves the ability. But what Dana's seriously, doing, you, you, let's say Dana Dana's not sitting there just observing one species, okay, as a marine biologist would no. do for twenty years. Thousands. He's out there making that broad sketch of what's going on in the ocean. Marine biologists aren't trained to do that anymore. You know, they're not there there are no Jack Cousteaus anymore. You know, that that's from a former era, you know, mm-hmm. of of uh, you know Good a point. Renaissance science. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Today marine biologists will study a very narrow range of species, again, for 20 years before making even the vaguest kind of conclusions. The problem in this whole division of science, we call the taxonomy of science, is the over-specialization of science, which prevents us from knowing things that are slapping us in the face. I'm not saying anything negative about Arnie. I'm just saying he's no longer present, not like yeah, he was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is, I, I regret that there's fewer and fewer people, but it's understandable if they do feel at a loss. They feel they don't know what they might be talking about and don't really want to talk if they don't know. So it's very tough. It's a very tough situation. So, you know, I don't know if he's under pressure, but I can also say you know, there's a many, many scientists are befuddled right now. They don't know even where to begin. I I'm concur. I'm not making excuses for them. It's just a, this is a mega, monstrous, complicated event that's beyond anything we've seen in our lifetime. And, and, and maybe, you know, it's the beginning of the science. What we got to do is look treat it like a Hollywood movie where we get all the greatest minds together and we come up with a solution and, and a way forward. You know, I had a way forward, and what I would do is I take all the... the Xbox gamers or PlayStation gamers, top-notch gamers, mm-hmm. and you would hook up cameras, high-powered cameras, can see for miles and miles. We got lots of that for surveillance, and we would hook them up all around Fukushima Prefecture, and these people can operate 
liquid, you know, hydraulic-driven robots that are backed by long hoses, two miles of hoses, three miles of hoses, and go in and dig up the whole site. Because when the site exploded, it put rods, and the rods had all these pellets in it. And each rod is 18 pounds and full of pellets. And so they're all over the site. They need to dig up three, four, five feet of that topsoil. But what they done was they went in and cemented everything and paved over everything. So that has to be taken apart, and they have to get that out of the, out of the ground because the whole ground is x-rays and neutrons and splitting atoms. And every time it rains, and that, that, that site is liquefaction where the water is coming up from the mountain, from the ocean itself, it's very unstable to spray water on it all the time. And the reason they have to do that is because they got all these rods underneath all that site and pellets in that. And these are extraordinary. A pound of it will kill everybody in a stadium in a couple of hours, but it kill everybody in a bar in about 20 minutes, and you can do that till the end of time. So they have to come out. We've got to get them out. And the solution is not just to bury them over and pretend they don't exist and pretend it didn't happen, because we have the documentation of all the, all the explosions, and we know that the rods were expelled out of the site far, far away. And that's the solution, is we have to start cleaning it up. It went Once miles again, you know, away, nanoparticulates. It went everywhere. Right. Right, and they have to dig up six feet of topsoil for a couple of miles around that site, and that's a start. That's a way forward. And then the only thing you're left with now is the coriums themselves, the melter reactors and the buildings and, and the Fukushima prefecture. But they have to start off somewhere, and a lot of it has migrated a lot deeper than that, certainly, but that is a huge step forward because that is one of the biggest problems is they're not even going to try to deal with that, and that's this stuff is supposed to be in a sarcophagus till the end of time, and so it's not. And that's the problem with it, is it's all over the country in, in every sense of the word. Japan, we know 60,000 square miles of it is highly polluted. We got the numbers from the, from the first year. And so that country is just devastated in another five or six years. According to the dog studies and the animal studies on radiation, they were cruel studies. Uh, we can see what's happening now is going to escalate in the human population because they're further up the food chain. Sure. But normally it would take 10 or 15 years for it to show up. This stuff is showing up right away because you were talking about earlier the sulfur peroxide hydrogen buckyballs that are created when they sprayed salt water in the reactor. is a whole different phenomenon. I worked out the numbers, and it works out with 1,200, uh, 1,400 Hiroshima bombs worth of radiation every day. Every that's not day? Counting, yeah, oh. that's not counting the spent fuel pools. You know, because they melt wow. it down. They're like a corian that goes down. That works out because of what Hiroshima was equated to 400, or um, Chernobyl was 400 Hiroshima bombs just over mm -hmm. 10 days. Mm -hmm. And Fukushima, the reactors are uh, 5 million pounds in each of those three melted reactors. And so that's a much bigger inventory by far than the buildings themselves are three times the size. And, of course, Chernobyl is one-third meltdown and at 30%. Correct. Uh, the size is, right, and then it stopped after 10 days, but you couldn't eat the sheep or drink the milk in germ or in Scotland and Ireland and Britain for the next 20, 25 years. Covered most of Europe. Right, and so that was that stopped after 10 days. Imagine if Chernobyl, like we said before, it never stopped, then we probably wouldn't have the problem we got with Fukushima because we wouldn't have got rid of it. It would have been so devastating. It would have got rid of us, no doubt, too, at the same time. And, you know, once again... It's it's time for uh, scientists and academics to make a stand because their future they got no pensions they got no future ahead of them. No. In the next five or six years is all going to be just totally gone. I have and a they question. Need to come together and speak here. Go ahead, Jeff. What if uh, there was some kind of a nuclear bomb that they could construct and drop on Fukushima? It would penetrate like a bunker buster deep enough and somehow vaporize or otherwise transmute most of the isotopes into something that would be manageable or just gone. Somebody suggested that in the beginning, that they nuke it to stop Wait. this. You so we'd have one, ahead, we'd have one shot to deal with, and we, we, could, we could handle that. But this chronic slow death, we can't. Well, well, the problem with that is yeah, a nuclear bomb could take some of the fissile material and transmute it with neutron bombardment and with well, basically proton bombardment uh, into uh, neutron and proton into, let's say, 
non-fissile elements, okay? okay? But the problem is it would also transform a lot of that material into even more radioactive elements. So you're just playing dice with the thing. And I, I think that is the problem. And also you have a risk of spread. You know, it'd be well, what uh, if very we had, difficult what, yeah, yeah, to what if, capture okay. that under, underground. And the problem is, again, the site is very close to the sea. So if you breach the seawall with that, it would... Oh, you just, would. would you, you absolutely it would. would. So I think there's too much, there's too much risk, risk entailed. That's why I go with, a, with the... Uh, Tunneling mm-hmm. idea, which there would be a lot more control, mm-hmm. and we could still, you know, uh, transfer that to a large area, much larger than the plant. These tunnels can be vast, and 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 basically hold it in dilution in a controlled environment. We have to use a lot, exercise a lot of control. The stuff, you know, any kind of wild, fast solution that bear a lot of risk, uh, uh, terrible negative consequences. And I don't think anyone will want to bear that risk if the thing just blew out into the sea. Mm-hmm. It would be like, uh, you know. It, it would be uh, instant. Well, I mean, I, it would have to blow out into the sea happens. because it, it's sitting on fill dirt. Yeah. Uh, it would go yeah, right out exactly. in the ocean. Exactly. And that's the problem with that theory. Whoever thought of it thought that the reactors were sitting on hard rock, which it's not. They didn't realize it's sitting on gravel. They hollowed out all the rock, which we found out on site. We had to go be there on site this last summer mm-hmm. to find that out, that the thing is sitting on a hollow space. Okay, so it's a good thing they didn't go through with that. So there are no quick solutions. There are no quick solutions. The problem is the tritium coming out, and I think that's a problem, the tritium in the water, because there's no way we can filter that out. And, and, and what, and yeah, you know, the word I like that Dana uses, the word of escalation. Things aren't getting better. Escalation is occurring. We're getting more and more material building up, and we're seeing more and more complicated radionucleotides coming up, and then the heavy water, the tritium coming out. So there is a massive escalation month by month, year by year. And it points to that if it builds up to a danger point, it'll be too late to evacuate the western coast of Canada and the U.S. So there has to be at least now contingency plans made to how we're going to move those, I don't know how many million people out there, the 40, 50 million people, how to move them, where to move them, and then who bears the financial responsibility for all the property losses and all the uh, health problems that are going to arise? Who pays for it when we have governments, the federal government, the Canadian government, which is still committed to nuclear power, mining uranium and all that? You, you see what I'm saying? That uh, you can sue them, but you, they would go bankrupt. Uh, oh, by nobody, cost. nobody the wins. The trillions of dollars in cost it would take to evacuate the entire West Coast to the Rockies, minimal to the Rockies, in a second contingency plan to, uh, you know, move them as far as Appalachia, okay? So basically, we've abandoned most of North America. Where would all those people go? How do we bear the cost? And who bears the cost of that? Obviously, the federal government should do it because it's been the main proponent of nuclear power. And certainly all the major corporations, GE, you know, the corporation's easy. They can just declare bankruptcy, right? But what will the Canadian federal government, the U.S. federal government do uh, if we have to, uh, you know, have a uh, implement a contingency plan, trillion dollar plan to move out, you know, let's say the majority of the American and Canadian population to very, very small areas of what's left uh, habitable on, in North America? Yeah, good point. Yeah, I mean they're cowards. I mean, let's face it, you know. If Obama had any guts, he would step forward and tell the truth of what is happening, what's got to be done, how we've got to at least begin to prepare for the worst case scenario. Now, without alarming people, just say, we've got this is a national crisis, this is a civil defense crisis. It's the largest crisis America has ever faced, okay? It's the largest crisis in the history, in the entire history of North America. And we're going back to, you know, since the Ice Age, since before the Ice Age, okay? That's how big this thing is. Who's got the guts to come out there? You know, does any president well, you know, candidate dare speak? Yeah. Yeah. Hey Yoshi, they actually got the plans in 1961, uh, 1965, 1970 to evacuate cities in case the Ruskies attacked them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So they kind of got a plan, but they they're basically just going to move them out of the city and then think about that later. But look, they, they evacuated the Chechen River folks uh, in Russia, uh, 7,500 communities along that river permanently, 9,000 square miles. And so the precedence has already been set. 
And that is, uh, you know, what you're saying, Yoshi, is 100% correct. You do have to evacuate North America, the coastline, and you do have to go several hundred miles minimum inland. That's the minimum. And by rights, you should be on the other side of the Rockies uh, from the Pacific Ocean because that's the minimum you should do. And, like, uh, Canada, on the East Coast, we have Ontario has 25 uh, nuclear reactors and the main water runs right past that. And so you can only evacuate basically the central Canada, but I don't know, but the Americans, they might have to consider, to consider once again, employing everybody to go to work at that. This new industry is uh, moving everybody out of the bloody country and having war crimes, and war crimes tribunals and everything else at the same time. Much like you've done for Rwanda, where they had so many criminals. That's what we're looking at right now in the nuclear industry. They're all criminals. I see Goddard's journal um, is being picked up by uh, James Colbert, who's recommending Goddard's journals now. And that's really confusing because Goddard's journals are all potassium-40. And so I don't know what's going on there. But, uh, you know, we can't count on all the people that we normally count on to get this right because it's very confusing. So I, I get where people are confusing. And where even great minds are coming out and pointing you at potassium-40 and the alternative movement out there needs people like yourself, Jeff, and Yoshi, more so than ever. And I know that's probably a bit of a shock to everybody, but um, we we got to learn to, to disregard people who are talking about potassium-40 or bananas or walking in sunshine or dental extras. you got to learn to call these people out. you got to learn to make a stand. You can't give them any any freedom. you got to take that freedom away from them to say that and you got to get in their faces, basically call up whoever published it, and you got to write them immediately. you got to, not just the comment section, but actually write the editors and write the newspaper itself and make a big stink about it and force them not to talk about that no more. And over a couple of months of hammering them, you could beat them down. But that won't happen unless people actually start doing it. And that's something everybody can do is say, hey, you shouldn't talk about bananas when you're talking about nuclear reactors because they truly don't. Oh, got nothing to do I know, with but the average person can't even explain the banana argument. Right. Huh. Right. And so people got to get well, educated well, on how you going to do sadly, that. Sadly, war crimes trials happen after the event. You know, that's not going to be very ha- helpful for all the people who are right now being victimized, whose health is being right. threatened, whose livelihood is going down, who homes are being dist- essentially made unlivable. So we do need something. You know, I think of George Bush and Shinzo Abe transferring secretly American warhead plutonium to Japan aboard Israeli ships, okay, with Israeli-American uh, people from GE working on basically nuclear weapons site in the Fukushima zone, you know, so... Which contributed to this massive, this incredible amount of very high strength plutonium, you know, that we're seeing come out, you know, uh, you know, 241. I mean, you know, we're seeing some incredible things come out. The evidence is there. You know, there's a science. It's not that many people, is it, Yoshi? Pardon? Is it, it's not that many people in the nuclear industry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah, I'm saying, uh, yeah, this would definitely be an act of justice, but if we wait, you know, it's, Six, seven years, I'm not sure there's going to be many of us left to press charges against anybody. We're in the midst of the disaster where war crime trials should have happened years ago. But it's interesting, this is the 70th anniversary of the defeat of Germany, Japan, which led to the Nuremberg and Tokyo war crime trial. Uh, very interesting. That's why we love you, Yoshi. We'll pontificate. They're not going to talk about the global war crime now being committed by the nuclear industry and the politicians who promote it, okay? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's awesome. Good point. That's You're well, good well point. Said. We do need a war crime. So this is a war crime. You know, nuclear energy is about war, and this is clearly a war crime against the global public, against everybody on this planet, and every life form. It's an equal side and genocide. Yeah, yeah that's going on. That's, four years. It's only beginning, but it's going to end in a total genocide and equal side. And you've seen the equal side where you are. It's going to spread sure. worldwide. Yeah. yeah. Shocking. It's shocking. It's devastating. Yeah. It's horrific every day. It's it's yeah. truly horrific each day to go out there. And I understand that I have to get it done no matter what. It has to be done. Well, we appreciate it. We have, you know, I mean, when, yeah, one thing people should understand is when Dana says being tossed around by high seas 
this is beyond imagination of all of us it land is. lovers, or even people who have done a little bit of sailing. You have no, uh, I think, I cannot comprehend the size and strength of the waves that have been hitting you. And they're, it's you know, it's crazy. Just, it's just, who would have known, you know, that it's only because of what we're doing that I'm willing to go up against it. And it's only because yeah. it, it's real and we can't deny it. And it's only because if we don't do it, they will continue to deny it and have an ability. And if we do it, then they don't have that ability to take correct, it away from them. Correct, correct. And so that's what we're trying to do is just our little part. And once again, all yeah, of and, and people, going, our listeners day. just got to realize Dana and his friends are are risking their lives mm-hmm. every second they're out there. And the, I mean, well, there are no friends anymore. It's just it's just Dana Yochi. It's just okay, him. No, <laughs> I mean, this is incredible ordeal. We yeah, we look yeah. at the stuff on Discovery Ch- Channel, crab fishermen, and all that. This is the conditions he's facing, and this is and by no means on a strong little steel trawler, you know. So. I hope everyone appreciates the effort that he's making here. You know, uh, really understand that this is life threatening. This is really sacrificial work that's being done. And I hope people take it seriously. We got to act, you know, not just listen. People got to figure out how they're going to act and respond with the same or at least approaching that level of courage that Dana is showing. He's showing us, the rest of us, how to be brave. Okay. And we've got the rest of us. All I want is braver than us. Mm-hmm. All I want for them is to become half as articulated as you or Jeff, Yoshi. That, that'll be mm-hmm. enough, you know, because that's all people need is to become articulate. And, you, like, that's what I'm saying. You can listen to one of these shows, and I guarantee you, you will learn, and you will learn fast, and you will learn properly, and you will have a narrative that works when you're trying to have a conversation. It's not a debate, it's a conversation. And because if you treat it as a debate, it's also against them, but if you treat it as a conversation, it's open to both sides. And you can have a, de- a debate when you boat up to speed. And so I'm going to let everybody go. It's been, uh, you wouldn't believe what kind of day this is pinned. Oh, go I get got, some at rest. At the end of the day, I was pinned up on a beach and, uh, took a big wave trying to get off the beach and was just coming back. I was beaten up, washing machine. I finally got in. It was just hellish. Yeah. Okay, folks. Hugs for everybody. Take care of okay. Jeff and Yoshi. All right. Take rest well. Folks. Get some sleep. Yeah, Thank good you. Luck, good luck. Good Happy good sailing. Good I hope good it calms good. down a bit out there. Happy sailing. Yeah, okay, I mean, I hope I'm going to run tomorrow, so 24-hour turnaround. Take yeah. care, folks. Yeah. Okay. Good night, Dana. Yeah, well, what he says about being pounded on a beach, oh, I, just don't, I don't know God. how many people have understood what it means, being trapped on the beach with sort of like a cliff behind you, gigantic waves rising and breaking and coming up with a tide. I don't... I don't know how many people recognize the terror of that, especially if you got your equipment down there and all that. You can't just try to clamber up a cliff. Uh, just what he's up with, what he's describing so calmly, actually, he is just terrifying. Yeah, you know, is is the pure force of nature. I don't know, Massive. honestly. I don't know how he's he's made it. It's it's that yeah. hard. It's it's, uh, uh, it's tremendous no. amount of bravery. And I think not a little bit of faith, too. You know, I mean, you know, the, you know uh, they say no man's an atheist in a foxhole. This man is, is not doesn't even have a foxhole. He's out there in the open with radiation, knowing full well that Fukushima uh, radioactive garbage is right there in the air he breathes, okay, and the water that, that, you know, the waves that hit him. Really tremendous. More people should be supporting him, and more people should be coming out. They should see that this is an example of how you face a crisis, You've got to risk your life for your children and grandchildren. Now, if you don't step forward, who will? Okay, don't expect the uh, you know uh, FEMA or somebody like that to come out. They'll be there to pick the bones. Okay, oh, too true. they'll be there to pick them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've all got to get out there uh, with and do our readings, uh, figure out our defenses, work together, build network, and uh, face this monster together, or we all surely will die alone. What what is uh what's the Japanese media doing now? Anything at all Nothing. much? <laughs> Nothing. This whole Fukushima robot thing has been downplayed. You know, now everyone is running away from it because they suddenly realizing Tokyo Electric is totally. You know, the robots were the great solution that to, uh, Tokyo Electric promised. The great hope is completely flubbed. It's failed. There's no other solution for them. So everyone has gone back into their sullen silence. Okay. And uh, pretending like nothing's happened. The culture of denial, massive. It's in the media. The media just can't face 
the implications of what this means, that there is no solution to Fukushima right now. You know, things, right. again, yeah. escalation is getting worse. I think I'm one of the few people in the world right now who saying the Tokyo Olympics have to be either canceled or moved, that the situation is escalating. Oh, they Tokyo absolutely within, have to Within be. the 200, if yeah. this was around Chernobyl, Tokyo would have been evacuated in a 200 kilometer evacuation zone, okay? Yep. Tokyo should have long ago been evacuated, radiation building up, and you saw what happened to those minky whales, you know, the radiation is getting worse and it is spreading, and not just from Fukushima, from dozens of other sites that have been damaged. The situation is out of control, and people are burying their heads in the sand, the radioactive sand. Pathetic. Just a bit. Although we did have a test case, you know, in Takahama, a judge did rule not to reopen that plant. That is so obvious. And with Fukushima melting down, with Mox Fuel totally discredited, finally uh-huh. takes a judge, okay, a local judge, to well, say, let's see no, you cannot reopen this we'll plant see if do they the over- same thing to Kyoto that you did to Tokyo, okay? Yeah. Well, we'll see if they override his decision. I hope not. Yeah. All right, Yochi, thank you for being here. Uh, take care. Uh, good luck on yeah, your... Yeah, uh, our heart's with Dana. I really hope that he gets back yeah. okay. And oh, yeah, you know, it's the guys. Minimize risk now. He's done his job. It's just he's, really... Absolutely. It, it is, yeah, there is some really sickening worry that, you know, of the situation there. I agree know, with so. you. I'm right yeah. on base Okay, with very you. good then, Jeff. Okay, it's see you great. next week. Okay, okay. night. Yoichi Shimatsu.